All right, welcome back to today. We are going to continue on with chapter number two. Number two. Um, one of the things that we touched on yesterday was some terminology of brokers and different aspects and people of this uh, industry. Today, we're going to continue on once again a little bit more with some basic terminology and understanding of concepts that you and I might use slightly different than a consumer would use. So, we're going to start down page. Looks like 18. Probably really need to put my glasses on when I do this. Unfortunately, vanity keeps me from doing that. I think seeing is overrated. So, you guys, did you guys see the movie Major League? Remember when Charlie Sheen wore put those horn rim glasses on? And the guy goes, "Well, seeing's the most important thing." And Wesley Snipes goes, "It ain't that important." That's kind of how I feel. All right. <clears throat> So on page 18, there are some terminologies that we're going to discuss that you need to understand who's actually saying these, all right? Because there are going to be terms that you have been using your whole career or your whole life that now may take on a different meaning in this profession. Yesterday, we spoke about the lender and the mortgage broker, how most consumers use those interchangeably because they don't understand that there's actually a difference. You now understand that. So here are some more terms that we're going to discuss. Let's start right out with a clean board today. And we're going to talk about some basic parts. That's actually not the board I wanted. This is the board I wanted. Uh, start out with some basic parts of Maybe we'll get there. Some of the terminology, all right? So let me minimize this so we can get you guys out of the way. First thing we're gonna talk about is this term land. Land is the physical dirt and earth that a person would own. And it includes all of the naturally occurring uh, plants that would in, be on that land. Typically, you own from the center of the earth to the heavens above, all right? So that is the definition of land. Now, I'm going to change this chapter around just a little bit because it kind of makes more sense. So in this land, it can actually be subdivided into three areas. You've got subsurface, you've got surface, and then you've got air. So you can actually divide land into three different subcomponents, all right? The surface is pretty obvious what we're talking about. This was that layer right there of ground that we all walk on. Now, in the subsurface, we're going to even divide it further because there are oil and gas rights, there are mineral rights, oil and gas, there are mineral, and there are water. All of these things can be even further subdivided out. I closed a deal in Bloomington several years ago. And as you guys may or may not know, Bloomington is well known for its quarries of limestone. We conveyed a piece of property or a piece was conveyed to us. We were actually the buyers. That in the title and the deed, it specifically stated that all of the mineral rights were not being conveyed to this because some farmer had sold those mineral rights dozens of years ago to some quarry company in case they ever decided to want to mine his property. Now, it caused a little bit of problem. We're not gonna get into the whole issue, uh, but the point that I'm making is here is that we actually got conveyed the mineral uh, did not get conveyed one of the subsurface rights. It turned out not to be a big issue because the company that owned them at that time apparently had went bankrupt and was being held in some trust and it hadn't been exercised in probably 50 years. So my buyer thought he was pretty safe, all right? The air rights is another concept. We will deal with air rights probably quite extensively 
because they have these things called air lots. You can buy and sell lots. This would be common in like condo buildings where somebody might own the 80th to the 80 or to the 90th uh, elevation. So air lots can be subdivided and you typically own to the heavens above. So what is defined as the heavens above? It's actually a really cool court case that defines this. Here's the thing. We understand that we own to the heavens above, but then there's this issue of people have sued Russia for Skylab going over their um, air. People have tried to sue T-Mobile. People have tried to sue TWA Airlines. Every court case has been cut down because there was a determination that at some level, there is a public benefit to airplanes flying over your property so people can travel. Same thing with TV signals and radio signals and T-Mobile signals and things of that nature. So even though we consistently say we own to the heavens above, that is probably a fallacy. So how high do we own? Glad you asked that. There was a court case in 1946. I've got this in my notes. Won't be on the test. Just a curious thing, interesting. Cosby versus the United States. It happened in Greensboro, North Carolina. There was a chicken farmer that had a chicken farm. And beside his farm, the Air Force opened a practice landing strip for their fighter pilots to practice landing airplanes. Well, apparently they were going so low and caused his chicken to actually become scared to death that they ran around and slammed into the barn and killed several of his chickens. So he actually ended up suing the Air Force for violating his airspace. This court case went all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. And there is a, now a ruling precedent that states that what I was just mentioning, that even though you may own to the heavens above, there comes a point that says, for the betterment of the public, you need to do that. You need to allow people to use it. So in the court case, they ask him how, fly, how high were the jets when they went over his property? His statement was 83 feet, not 80, not 100, but 83. I don't know how he knows that. I don't know if he could throw a baseball that high and hit one, but the ruling became 83 feet. So basically what I'm telling you is you own till 83 feet above your structure because they ruled that the government was in violation and they had to uh, compensate him for all his dead chickens, okay? So you've got this rule on the books from the United uh, US Supreme Court that says 83 feet below is practically what you can exercise as your property and your use. Well, the FAA came in and they took 500 feet and above and made that, you know, airspace that is controlled by the government for air flight. So what you have is this 83 feet limit and then this 500 foot. There's a lot of room in there, which up until recently hasn't been a big issue or a uh, concern until that now we have drone technology and drone technology potentially could fly in that space currently there's not been a court case that supports or denies this but my statement or my feeling is that in that 83 feet to 500 feet range drones could practically fly without being under the purview of the faa or in your private property. There are people all the time that go, well, if a drone flies over my house, I'm gonna shoot it down. Well, I don't know, we gotta, we're gonna have to figure that out because of that 83 
limit. All right. So that was just an interesting court case, but I still laugh when I read it that he stated 83 feet. Look that up. Cosby versus the United States. C-A-U-S-B-Y, if you want to look that up. 150 chickens. Killed 150 of his chickens. Can you imagine standing out there and all these chickens running around and slamming into the building? And <laughs> Maybe I'm twisted, I don't know. Now, the land has physical characteristics that give it value. The first physical characteristic is that a land is immobile. We mentioned that the other day as in the supply and demand. You cannot move land, all right? Will Rogers said, hey, buy land. They're not making any more of it. So you cannot move land. So immobility. Indestructibility is another concept. You cannot destroy land. You could dig a hole in it, but you actually still own the hole and the dirt. So you cannot really destroy land. That's another physical characteristic that gives it value. And the last one is uniqueness. No two pieces of real estate are the same. They are all unique. Now in your book, they use a term called non-homogeneity. Guaranteed, they love this uh, word. On your exams and on the state exam, there are no definition questions. Okay, this holds true with both mine and the state. At no time are they going to ask you what this means. What does this word mean? But what they're going to do is use definition words in the question or the sentence or their answers. And you're going to have to know what those words mean to determine sometimes what the question's actually asking or what the answer actually means. So they might throw in the word as an answer, non-homogeneity as an answer, and you're going to have to understand, oh, that means uniqueness. So it's a way of the state to actually get two questions out of you by using a definition word inside of the question. So keep that in mind. And the book loves to use alternative words, mainly, like I said, so they can double up their questions on you. So one of the suggestions I would give you is flashcards. If you've got the study pack, there is a series of flashcards in there that will work great on your cell phone. All right, you turn your phone sideways, turn your phone sideways, and the definition comes up, you click it, it'll give you the word, all right? The other thing to do is maybe write your own flashcards, all right? Now, if you decide to write your own flashcards, one of the hints I'm going to give you is try not to define or put the definition as a Merriam-Webster's definition. You know, don't go, there, well, the party of the first part does hereby agree to. No, don't worry about that. Write something that you understand. Make sure it's true, but write something you understand as the definition, like the word non-homogeneity. Just on the back, right, means the same as uniqueness, okay? And you understand what uniqueness is, so you don't really have to give a definition. It's just something so that when you see those words, my wife teaches third grade, and I remember all my kids going through, and if you've got young kids, they will do this too. They are called sight words. You know, when you learn to read, you learn sight words. Certain words, just when you see it, you automatically knows, know what it means. That's how you need to be with these definitions throughout the entire book. When you see the word non-homogeneity, oh, it's unique. It's a sight word that you better understand.